Good evening. My name is Sinead, and I'm joined by my lovely co-host. Hello, everyone. My name is Brefni, or the lovely Bref, or invisible producer Bref, depending on how you ask. Yeah, pretty much. So, for a bit of context, obviously, normally you are used to listening to myself and Kate on this particular feed, but given the current pandemic that is happening around the world, me and Kate can't record together because it would be very irresponsible to not stick to the social distancing and Brefni is social distancing in my house. Because I'm being very responsible. Yes. So we figured rather than have people without a podcast to listen to, because I think everybody's getting quite bored and cabin fever is setting in for a lot of people. It absolutely is. And we thought that we wanted to do our part to make that a little bit easier and give people a bit of a distraction for the next, well, next hour or so. Yeah, exactly. So what we're going to do for the next few weeks until hopefully life settles back down again Mm -hmm. is we are going to watch disney movies as we would probably do anyways that's very true especially with uh disney plus launching properly four days as of when we're recording this four days four days away how exciting and for those of us who paid for a disney life subscription up to this point only to be greeted with an email yesterday that said disney life is now cancelled Oh, really? Yeah, no, I got a full-blown email saying it's now cancelled. You can still access Disney Life up to this date. Interesting. It was all all very strange. But either way, with the launch of Disney+, Plus, now is the absolute right time to try something like this out. Exactly. So sit back, pour yourself, a, pour yourself a drink. We are currently enjoying... We're doing a real Diz After Dark thing here. I am currently enjoying a Jemison Crested with some Coke Zero out of my Darth Vader tiki mug. Yes, well, I, meanwhile, have a Stormtrooper tiki mug, and I am enjoying some Brewdog Hazy Jane. Why Hazy Jane? Because it was the only thing left in Tesco. Yeah. So, I put up a post on the Instagram, the Mickey Waffles Instagram, that is, a few days ago asking, did people think we should watch Robin Hood? Or do people think we should watch Hercules? And everyone was wrong. Now, anybody that has listened to Mickey Waffles before, y'all know I love... Hercules. So clearly that was my choice. But you picked Robin Hood, which sadly lost. I did pick Robin Hood, but I'm going to be advocating for Robin Hood extremely strongly over however the next many weeks we end up doing this and into the future. Because at some point we are going to do Robin Hood because I have such a close personal connection with that movie. I know. And at some point that will be done. There will be some poll which we're going to keep going week to week. We're going to let you guys decide what it is that we cover. So we're going, so Sinead's going to pick one thing and I'm going to pick another and we're going to go from there. And at some point Robin Hood will resurface and I plea to everyone listening the next time it comes up for the love of Christ, please vote for it. Yeah. So we'll post them. We'll maybe post the next one on Sunday. Yep. Sunday's a good day. And you guys can pick. We won't ever specifically say which is whose pick because we think it's fairer to not, but there will obviously If people listen to Mickey Waffles, they'll be able to guess some of mine, I can imagine. Absolutely. But on that note, forget everything I just said about my advocacy for Robin Hood. It's completely anonymous. You will not know at all. (laughs) That is fine. So we, I suppose the way we thought about structuring this is that we would go through the movie. We'd give some facts and figures. I love facts. Bref loves nerdy movie figures. I certainly do. And we'd go through the movie. We'd give you our thoughts. We've painstakingly taken notes whilst watching the movie we have some of them are quite similar some of them are a little bit hilarious and then we thought we'd give i think if we cover four things story Mm -hmm. cast slash characters animation and music so i think they're the four things that we'll kind of grade it on and then maybe we'll give an overall Overall an overall rating out of five and then i've asked you lovely folk who follow us on the instagram what your thoughts are so we will go through those at the end as well absolutely sounds great perfect so do you want to start us off absolutely so ladies and gentlemen i hope you're sitting comfortably it is time for some facts and figures about disney's hercules 
really hope you enjoy this. This is literally the only reason why I have a Masters. Now, Hercules was released in 1997 to much critical aplomb. It is the 35th animated classic. It was directed by Ron Clements and John Musker, who previously directed The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Princess and the Frog, and Moana. It cost 85 million of your finest dollars to make, and it made 252.7 of the audience's finest million back in the box office. Mm. Currently holds a 7.3 out of 10 on IMDb, and 84% on Rotten Tomatoes. This is a total side note, but earlier in the week, it was St. Patrick's Day. It was. And we watched Darby O'Gill and the Little People. We did. Which is an, an, a Disney classic. It has to be said. It is certainly a film we watched. And I decided to look up the Rotten Tomatoes rating for Darby O'Gill and the Little People. It got 100%. I feel like not many people voted for it. Well, you see, here's the thing with Rotten Tomatoes. Because Rotten Tomatoes is ultimately... Was that the the Rotten Tomatoes rating or the user rating, if you remember? I don't know. It was probably the critical rating at that time. So Rotten Tomatoes fundamentally weighs up whether or not something is good or bad and then, and then distributes it from there. Now, Dario Gill is not a film that I grew up with in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. I have watched it once, and that was on St. Patrick's Day this year. Oh, it's I so had, good. I had never seen it before. Um, overall, I would give it, especially for the time, I would have given it a positive rating. Yeah. So with Rotten Tomatoes, what that essentially means is in terms of all critical reviews, they can still locate. It got overall all positive, no negative. Oh, okay. I get you now. Yeah. So... Overall, just to tip off Dario again, the little people, it's worth watching. And I do think that from a cultural standpoint, there's a number of things, obviously, about Irish culture it really gets wrong. Yeah. But at the time, especially given the fact it was made in conjunction with what was the Irish Tourism Board at that time, um, there was a lot of adapting of whether it be folk tales or, you know, historical accounts or whatever it may be. Yeah from Irish folklore, there was a really decent attempt, in all fairness, to make oh, something absolutely. good out of it. And for me, it was one of those films that, you know, when you see a movie when you're a bit late on in life and you just kind of go, I really wish I'd seen this as a kid. Hmm. Dario Gill and the Little People was very much one of those for me. Incidentally, so was Hercules. Yes, because you actually only watched Hercules for the first time a few months ago. I did, because the way that things worked in my house when I was growing up is we had a load of Disney movies on VHS tape. Yeah. But there were some we just flat out didn't have. So, for example, I the one that I will always point to is that we didn't have Aladdin on VHS. Oh, but sad we, times. But we did have The Return of Jafar and Aladdin the King of Thieves. Right. So as a result, I'm a pretty firm advocate for those. But for whatever reason, we never had Hercules. Okay. Which I still don't really understand why. But we didn't at the time anyway, whenever it came out. So I somehow did not actually watch Hercules until very, very recently. And it's one of those films that I really wish I had seen as a kid. Yeah. Because I think I would be, not to play my hand here too early would have been a huge fan of that film growing up. It's so good. It really is very, very good. But either way, we have two very differing perspectives coming into this yeah. overview of Hercules in terms of what what sort of allegiance that we might have towards it. Because inevitably, if you're a big fan of a film as a kid, much like I am with Robin Hood, there's a certain amount of rose tinted glasses that you're going to look at all these things with. And you're willing to forgive its failings because you will value the personal connection more, which yeah. is entirely fair. Like, ultimately, all film reviews of any kind are entirely subjective. So that's entirely fair. But either way, with this particular overview of Hercules, you're going to get two very different perspectives. Yeah, so a bit of context for me. Hercules is arguably my favourite Disney movie. There's a lot of different facets to different types of Disney movies. I will always say Hocus Pocus is my all-time favourite movie, mm -hmm. which is also technically Disney, but... It's a very different movie. So I loved Hercules when I was a kid. I loved the movie. I loved the TV show that used to be on Disney Channel. And I also loved the PlayStation game from back in the day, which I reference in my notes in this. I did play that, actually. It was so good. So, so good. Um, I will fight most people that try and tell me that Hercules doesn't have one of the best soundtracks from 
the Disney Renaissance period because you're wrong if you think it doesn't because it's just so good. It's so catchy. There's a pretty high bop quota in that soundtrack. It's it's phenomenal. And then also, I've continued to love it the whole time that I've been a Disney fan. When I worked for Disney, Megara was a character on my badge at one stage as well when I was manager. Whenever something that we used to do a lot in the Disney store is that we would, when we would do inductions and stuff like that, we'd always ask people, what Disney character are you most like and why? And I would always say Megara because there's no BS with her. She is straight to the point. And, but she does also, she has a pretty big heart as well. She just doesn't like to show it, which I feel like is pretty apt for me. Well, sweetie, to pull back the curtain very slightly for the lovely listeners that we have on here, we've been together for four years and that is immensely apt. Yeah. The the comparisons with yourself and Megara are probably closer to almost any other Disney character. Although there's distinctly elements of Marie from the Aristocats in there. Well, I won't I won't I won't deny that. So with without further ado, will we start going through the movie? Absolutely. Okay. So the movie starts out with originally a storyteller telling you about Hercules and the gods and all of that, and he gets so graciously interrupted by the fab. Five muses. We'll take it from here, darling. You go, girl. The opening number is fantastic. Um, to set to set the table for Hercules, the opening number, along with most of the rest of the tracks throughout the throughout the movie, are a very definite mixture of both gospel music and also Motown. Yeah. And for a movie that's ultimately based on essentially a Greek comedy or Greek tragedy. That's a fantastic choice. Yeah. Do you know Do you know who was supposed to originally be the Muses? Actually, I don't. It was supposed to be the Spice Girls. Was it? Yes. And I have it in my notes that I think that I don't think Hercules would be the movie it is. If because when you think back, nineteen ninety seven, the Spice Girls were everything. They were. Yeah. Everything. They were everywhere. They were originally supposed to be the Five Muses, and then for contractual reasons or whatever, they couldn't do it. So it ended up being the five muses that we have now. But can you imagine how much different the movie would be if it had been the Spice Girls? The best way I can describe that is that comes across as a more sort of DreamWorks-y decision. Agreed. And I mean that for both the best and worst of that statement. Now, DreamWorks is, from my perspective anyway, coming from a not quite as disney belligerent fan person perspective belligerent belligerent yes how rude thank you Uh, no belligerent in the best possible way belligerent isn't always terrible but i think that would have dated this movie significantly i agree and i think that at the time yeah it probably would have played pretty well but there's also the certain the certain amount of the fact that you need to rely on the acting ability of the spice girls and I've sat through Spice World a number of times. I will not have a bad word said about the Spice World movie on this podcast. And it's a wonderful film. Thank you. Um, However, there are certain, perhaps, uh, performance quirks, should we say, that some of the individual Spice Girls have. I think that that would have also distracted from the story. Yeah. Because I think that adds in a certain amount of not quite an unreliable narrator thing which is always a fun convention to play with in films but it does distract you from what they're ultimately supposed to do yeah i agree it it kind of reminds me of so kate on the instagram during the week watched the live action lion king and Mm. was asking people what their thoughts were and one of the things that somebody said was that beyonce being nala completely overpowered the whole thing because all people could hear was Beyonce yeah and considering Nala's supposed to be a secondary character much like the muses are secondary characters they're not vital to the main story they facilitate it I think if they had been such well-known voices to your point I think it totally would have been distracting exactly and that's not to say that that you couldn't really you know you can still get high profile actors in this particular position like Toy Story is an ultimate example of that getting uh, getting Tom Hanks and Tim Allen to play those parts. With actors, it's different. But the second you start involving vocal artists, yeah, that's when things get rather complicated. And from my perspective, the five people who they got to do the muses instead was a far better fit because ultimately they're designed to be the Basil Exposition. 
They're designed to progress the story. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be a nice little link between different scenes yeah. before we get to the big training montage, before we do X, Y, and Z. That's what they're supposed to do. And by them being relatively, for lack of a better term, anonymous, I think that works very well. My other question with that is if it was the Spice Girls, I can't really see the Spice Girls doing gospel slash Motown style music. I think it was supposed, I think it was supposed, I actually don't know what the music stylistically was supposed to be, because I assume it wasn't supposed to be what it is now. No, but the thing is, I think that that would have massively let the film down. Yeah. Because although the gospel and Motown style is a little bit jarring with, you know, the ancient Greek theme that's going on, yeah. it still really, really fits because of the way that they, as we're going to detail later, kind of work in the animation style, or rather the mix of animation styles that go through the entire film. I think it fits. It shouldn't, but it fits. But it works. It absolutely works. Yeah. So that's the muses and the kind of opening of the movie. I know you've just mentioned the animation there. I have down here that the animation is super unique compared to... I have specifically down here other Renaissance movies. For When I say Renaissance, I mean the Disney Renaissance. So yep. the 90s movies. Um, however, I think it's very different to any anything Disney's really done because the background is very kind of almost watercolor it's in very a way. Or, it's very ornate. And then the characters are very stark and swirly. Yeah. No, <laughs> no I made a note of this and it's... A mixture, for me, it's a mixture of the design on Aladdin and Disney tunes. Yeah. And I mean this in the best possible way, because the character animation is really quite stark. It's all very defined colours, there's very little shading, it's all very... They all have swirly nipples. They all have swirly nipples, and more power to them for that fact. They also all have really tiny ankles. I have this further down, but everybody in this movie has, like, non-existent ankles. I'll be totally honest, I didn't notice that. Yeah. But this movie is a strange fusion of animation styles because the backgrounds, or in the case of the opening number, where you have all of the, you know, the ornate uh, vases and other um, assorted crockery that one might have. Assorted crockery. Assorted crockery that one might find in your kitchen or anything like that. There's a very strange mix of animation styles because the characters are very, very much designed to be as easily animatable as humanly possible, whereas the backgrounds and other details are not. Yeah. Now, for me, that stuck out quite a bit because it's unusual to see a mix of animation styles. It actually also echoes a little bit Beauty and the Beast because you have the color palettes particularly and the color mixing of, for example, if we take the ballroom scene in Beauty and the Beast, you have a reasonably stark contrast between the ornateness of the ballroom and the Beauty and the Beast character models. Yeah. With this, it shouldn't work because of how ornate the backgrounds and details are, but it weirdly does, and it helps the animation stand out. Yeah, I agree. And it, it it's almost like, to a certain extent, they had a different stylistic idea of what they wanted Hercules to be to begin with. Mm-hmm. And it seems like they swapped out the character models at a very late stage. Now, I don't know at all if this was actually done. Yeah, I'm not too sure. But there was, but for me, there was, a, there was a real stark contrast. And in some way, in some ways, that's a very good thing. Because it does allow for, in certain cases, reuse of animation. And also the ease of, you know, the elasticity of animation where you can make things do whatever you need to do because animation is the one medium that allows you to do that. Lads, can you guess that Brefni has a master's in film? I do, and I briefly specialise in animation. I'm very sorry about this, guys. <laughs> so we go through the initial storytelling part of the movie and then we get to Lil Baby Herc's christening. And the only kind of major thing I have from that is that Baby Pegasus is the cutest freaking thing. Baby Pegasus is adorable. Oh, my good golly gosh, he is so freaking cute. Don't get me wrong, I love adult Pegasus as well, but baby Pegasus is just so freaking cute. And then the other thing to call out is that Hades is one of the most charismatic Disney characters to ever be created. He is hilarious. Hades is fantastic. And at this point, I don't think I would have appreciated Hades quite as much as a kid as I do now. Oh, no, definitely because not. Because this, a large part of Hercules just feels like an episode of Seinfeld. Oh, yes! There are so many links. I legitimately, in my notes, have Jerry Seinfeld is here, I see, which <laughs> is 
the um, the messenger character, whose name I can't quite remember. Huh? You know the guy with the wings who goes around doing the... Oh, I can't remember his name. The marathon guy, yeah. basically. Um, he's essentially just Jerry Seinfeld, and I didn't check my notes to see if it was Jerry Seinfeld. But either way, this is a very long episode of Seinfeld in so yeah. many different respects. I agree. And that's very much of the time. It's a very late 90s thing. It makes sense. Hades is a brilliantly done villain because you could have just made him very cookie cutter. Yeah. He's the god of the underworld. You could have just made him incredibly dull and just 100% vengeful. Yeah. Instead, you make him a guy who is oozing charisma. Yeah. And shooting one-liners out of his hip like there's no tomorrow. And James Woods, who voiced Hades, actually most of his lines were ad-libbed. He had a script, but he kind of ad-libbed most of it and they just... Let him have at it. And he has said on numerous occasions that Hades is one of his all-time favorite roles that he ha- has ever played. And anytime Disney have asked him to re- reprise his role, so for example, in Kingdom Hearts and stuff like that, he's always like, absolutely, yeah, let me do it. Yeah, because you see, this is the same thing. It's the same thing that Disney allowed Robin Williams to do with Aladdin in 1992, is that they gave a base script and just kind of went, look, just go whichever direction you want, we'll work the animation in. Because obviously the voiceover acting is done so far in advance yeah. to allow the storyboarding and everything like that. And I wonder I wonder if that's Ron and John. Ron and John's great. Ron and John's input. Like, I wonder if that's just how they were quite happy to let things flow. Because it's sure... funny that we've made the parallel and there are two movies that were directed by we them. We have indeed. I'm sure Big Ron and Little John were completely on board with this entire thing. Yeah. And having that kind of fluidity. It's something that is also a regular comment on the guys who did the Lego movie. Yeah. In the sense that they would just allow a certain amount of riffing because ultimately that's going to give you a better idea of the character. If you let the actor loose and don't, cons- don't 100% constrict them to a script you're going to end up with something that becomes sort of more a natural evolution of what that character would have said. It's a lot yeah. less stilted. It's a lot more natural. Hades is, as a result, one of the most understandable villains in oh, a Disney movie. Absolutely. And just a final point on James Woods. The movie went massively over budget when they were filming. Massively over budget. I'm not surprised at all. To the point that he said that he would waive his his fee so that the movie would be able to get finished because he loved the character of Hades so much. He was like, you don't even have to pay me. I just want to do this. He did get paid in the end. Disney are obviously not short of cash. They're doing all right. He did get paid, but he did offer to do his role completely free because he just wanted them. He didn't want the movie to not get made and him not be able to be Hades. Mm -hmm. So that was my last little factoid on that. So after Hades shows up, did you have any more notes or anything that you wanted to mention about the christening? Uh, no, I'm calling was... it a christening. It's probably more like a baby shower. I mean, I don't know if the gods necessarily subscribe to the Christian ways and Christian celebrations. We don't know necessarily. The only other additional notes that I had here are big meeting, beautiful color construction, which mm-hmm. it was. It's a stunning looking scene. Uh, Zeus, Cloud Whisperer, because we make him do whatever he whatever he wants. Um, oh shit, it's Hades is the next note that I had. Oh, so good. And that leads to the scene with Hades in the underworld. Yes, so I, understandably, being the creepy soul I am, love the underworld. I think it is so well animated. I think the faces and the bodies in the river look amazing. They do. And I jo- I love everything about Hades Lair. His place is a big giant skull. Like, how could I not love this? And my arguably two favorite Disney sidekicks are Pain and Panic. And the note I have down here is Pain and Panic are like Christmas temps in retail. And I mean this in a very loving way, (laughs) but it's just the two of them are very needy and they're needy together and they just always need to like triple check things with Hades. Anyone that has ever been a manager in retail and has had to deal with Christmas temps, you know what I mean. A fun fact, I've also been a manager in retail and I had to curtail with Christmas temps. In fact, in a number of different jobs, that was my sole purpose because I was good at them. Um, The notes that I have on Pain and Panic are... It's Zazu if he'd taken his first job offer after graduation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so again, like brand new into a job. Brand new into a job, doesn't really know what they do, really wants to do a good job, but needs direction to do everything, including probably go to the bathroom. There's rather a lot to unpack here. The other thing that I, the other notes that I had about the underworld was it has a very reverse good place vibe. Oh, interesting. 
Uh, for those of you who watched the, who watched the Good Place, you might be you might get an idea of what it is that I'm talking about. If you haven't watched the Good Place, instantly get on that. It's a very good show. Yeah. So then we meet the Fates. We do. They look like they smell bad. Oh yeah, they do actually. Why is one of them Cockney? The tall one is Cockney, and I have no idea why because the other two are not even remotely British, let alone Cockney. I'm going to guess that the voice actor was going for a bit. I guess. Um, and you know, I'm a big fan of rip de do apples and pears, rip de do in any sort of context. Yeah. So I'm totally fine with that. I don't need necessarily for there to be, I mean, culturally speaking, there are many different mixes going on. This is an ancient Greek tale oh, yeah. that is being told by, by characters with entirely American accents. Yeah. So if one of them wants to be Cockney, go for it. Yeah. True. True, true, true. So... The fates tell Hades that his grand plan will not happen if Hercules is still around to fight on the blessed day that all the planets align and yada, yada, yada. So he tasks Pain and Panic with going and killing baby Hercules. Yes. So they do a Mother Gothel style kidnapping of baby Hercules. They give him a bottle with a potion to kill him. However, he doesn't drink the last drop. Nope, the last drop is left there, which leads to a very nice opening third act of the movie later on. The other note that I have on this is that in some cases, a number of assets for LeFou were definitely used for pain. You think? Absolutely. There's a number of... The movements in particular are very, very similar. And in all fairness, if you have those at your disposal, use them. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So Herc disposes of pain and panic. And he gets adopted by two lovely people who unfortunately are not able to have their own children. So he grows up thinking that he's human, which for the most part he kind of is because he had that serum, whatever it was. And then we go into the next scene where we have teenage Herc looking like a puppy that hasn't grown into their paws. We do indeed. And he's confronted by a number of people who don't want to invite him to play with them. One of whom might as well have been Dolph Ziggler and do and does not oh care God, for her. Oh yeah. Poor yep. little Jerkules. Poor little Jerkules. So one thing to note with this particular scene. So this is where he is going somewhere with his dad and a, go- a load of bale of hay, bale of hay, hay bales, hay bales. a load of hay bales. And he demolishes a whole town. As you do. Now, another little fun fact about this particular scene is there's actually an error in the animation. So if you watch it, the first way it's animated and when you look at it from the outskirts, it's starting from the middle of the round bit and it's going all the way out. So it's starting in the middle and it's going to end in two parallel lines, basically. However, when it finishes in the up close one, it finishes in the middle of the circle. It does. And the entire reason it does is to allow for the strike joke to happen, which is entirely fair because I really like that joke. Yeah. So just something to keep an eye out for the next time you watch it. And yet another Seinfeld incident in this particular movie, incidentally. Okay. With the merchant who's vaguely holding up both sides of the uh, temple arches, I'm reasonably sure is one of the characters in Seinfeld. Okay, cool. And then there is a strike. Nice throw! So, while Hercules might be the clumsiest person of all time, he's a damn good stone skimmer. He certainly is. And this leads into the... Oh, I guess Herc's opening number. Go the distance, which is a beautiful song. If you can adopt a child like Hercules, please call. Oh dear. <laughs> it's such a beautiful song though. And it, I have down here, it, it leads to a really quite sweet scene of him saying goodbye to his adoptive parents. And especially because like mid nineties was very lads, lads, lads. So seeing a teenage boy embracing particularly his dad in that respect for that period of time really wasn't seen a whole lot, particularly in movies. So it's nice that that was given that space. It was. I completely agree with that because, again, this is we're talking about 1997. If you made that film now, it would not be in any way surprising. But 1997, especially with a guy who's supposed to be, you know, like this ultimate facet of you know, manhood and godliness or whatever Hercules is supposed to be. It's really nice to put that together. Yeah. So he goes off to the Temple of the Gods and he meets with his big old stone 
His big old stone dad, Zeus. It's Herc on tour and he's visiting the temple of dad. Aw, that's cute. But also, he gets reintroduced to his best pal, Pegasus. Why do Disney create such good horses? And why are they all just doggos? I think possibly because horses by themselves are a little uninteresting. Oh. In all honesty, and this comes from a very... Your whole house is decorated in horses. It is. My mom is a particularly big fan of horses and horse racing and show jumping in particular. I worked in the bookies for a year, so I was kind of surrounded by that kind of culture as well. But it's very hard to anthropomorphize a horse into anything other than a dog. Because the basic idea is that it, it comes from the, you know, the, the, it comes from the theory of wartime where a horse basically becomes like your best friend. Yeah. And it's very hard to relate that with something that's ultimately a utility like a horse would be in that context. Yeah. So the easiest thing is to make a horse like a dog. But like Disney, Disney just do the best horses. And reindeer. I'm going to include Sven in this. Yep. You can include Sven. Horse type things. Maximus, Angus from Brave. Yep. Sven, there's so many good horses. There really are. And it's only when you start digging around that that you realize that, yeah, you do want to really have these, I guess, companion characters Mm. with their own personality that doesn't undercut the main character at all. But Disney are fantastic at that. And Pegasus has a lot of personality. Pegasus has a lot going for him. Yeah, he's a... He's a a magnificent horse with with the brain of a bird. Yeah, and he's thick. As we will, as we get to when he tries to cram his way into Phil's house. Absolutely. And speaking of Phil, so we encounter Philoctetes. What's your thoughts? Okay, so Phil is an interesting character. Okay. The character of Phil, first of all, Danny DeVito is incredible. The, no one else could have paid Phil. He is so incredibly good at making someone who is ultimately... Very creepy. Oh, absolute creep. Immensely likable. Mm. To the point where you don't quite forgive how creepy he is. To the point where I would say that if you tried making this movie now, that wouldn't fly. No, I agree. But I think in the context of the time, that isn't charming. But the rest of what he does is charming. Mm. He is just, again, an extremely charismatic presence. He's very much a down-on-his-luck old boxing coach, basically lifted straight out of the Rocky films. Yeah. And he is exceptionally good at that. Um, I will point out also with this scene, it's not great that he's ultimately hunting nymphs. Yeah. In the initial scene, because you get uh, you get a setup for Phil that mercifully doesn't really pay off throughout the rest of the film. There are one or two other moments, particularly around Megara, yeah. where it does amp up a little bit. But for the most part, that's not everything the character is looking for. Because you can have some things in animated films in particular where you have some characters who their motivation is something related to the opposite sex. Yeah. And that's, they might do something nice as a side project, but ultimately they're still after their, their goal of whatever it may be. In this particular case, that's not what, that's not in any way what's happening. Yeah. It's more a case of Phil gets easily distracted. Yes. Yeah. Very true. Um, this then leads us into Phil's song, which is just... The PlayStation game from the 90s. It is. And I love every second of it. Now, what I will say about Phil's song is, I don't think it's a song, it's that... Oh, no, it's a terrible song. It's a terrible song. It's very weirdly composed. What saves it are the number of visual gags throughout the entire thing. Yeah. That makes just, like, whether or not it be the, you know, slightly beforehand, the Achilles joke, the flying saucer conspiracy joke, anything that kind of happens throughout... It's almost like the anti-friend like me song. Oh yeah, I from agree. Aladdin, from my perspective, where it all seems a little bit thrown together, but it really, honestly, quite works. And it's also a very good way to work in sort of uh, the the I guess the montage of Hercules growing up and training because those can always be a little bit clunky. Yeah, kind of. It's like the I'll make a man out of you scene in Mulan. Yeah, it's a similar. It's a similar. It's a similar vibe. Thing. So Herc goes into this song. Uh, clumsy teenager and comes out of it as joshua from friends yes here comes the wet quilt of friends side characters Uh, i had i had spent so much of my life loving hercules and loving friends and had never put the fact that adult hercules is joshua together until probably about three or four years ago and it has ruined it for me because all i hear is joshua and then it just makes me think of that scene from friends where rachel's like joshua Oh, Josh. Ooh, ah. Joshua. Josh. 
Uh, hello? Hi. <laughs> so I apologize to everybody if I've never done that to you as well, but... That's something you're never going to be able to unhear. No, I'm sorry. You're welcome. Ugh. So, Herc has grown. He's a big old strong boy now. He is, and he's going to Thebes. But first, enter Megara. Hello, Megara. Absolute queen. I love Megara. Megara is a fantastic character. She is one of the most badass female characters that Disney have ever produced. And again, this is 1997. Yeah. Now, the way that Megara is framed is that she's ultimately a turncoat who turns good at the end. And that's a bit of a different setup to yeah. the way that a lot of modern female Disney characters are, which is a good thing. But Megara at no point is actually really played as the damsel in distress character. And that is fantastic, especially for the time. Like, yeah. Megara also seems equally like someone who could kick everyone's ass in a bar fight and also someone you want to have a drink with afterwards. Oh yeah, she could drink you under the table. She could absolutely drink you under the table. And, but by the same token, she also doesn't lose any of her femininity in that transition. She's no. not played to be a bloke, which is the other thing that happened in the late 90s animation rather a lot. The complete, you know, the yeah. overuse of the tomboy. That's not being done either. She's a brilliant character and holds up so well 23 odd years later. Yeah, I agree. She is kind of like an anti-hero. She's by no means a hero or trying to be a hero, but she's not a villain either. She's kind of that she's kind of that Jack Skellington type character where he's not necessarily a he's not necessarily a good guy. No, no. Because he does still kidnap people and leave horrifying gifts in people's houses. But he's not a bad guy either. He's not Oogie Boogie Bad. Oogie Boogie Bad. Good lord. But yeah, so I think I tend to gravitate more to the anti-hero type characters. So I think that's why, why I love Meg so much. That and she's just so goddamn sarcastic and I love it. Yeah, it's really, really great. And just in the general introduction scene of Megara, there are just a couple of things I wanted to point out as well. Uh, first of all, there's a use your head joke, mm -hmm. which is taken entirely from Toy Story. Okay. With, uh, with Rex. Yes. And I have no problems with this. This is another scene where Phil would be creepy in a modern context. Yeah, and she completely calls him out on it. Calls him out massively on it. And that very firmly establishes Megara as, an, oh, okay, all right, grand. And uh, the other note that I have for this scene is Pegasus is jealous. Oh, he is. He very jealous. Is. Very jealous. Is not on board with Megara. And one of my favorite. So after Herc and Pegasus and Phil fly away from saving Meg... A little bunny and a little squirrel come up to her, to which she says, oh, look, a couple of rodents looking for a theme park, which just made me laugh because clearly it's a reference to the Disney parks. There's a lot of meta humor. Oh, yeah. In this movie. And I'm completely on board with that because while that's littered across everything now, mm. that you, if you have a character who is remotely sarky, you're going to get meta humor. But it's played very straight here and as a line by itself functions entirely well. Oh, yeah. It's just nice to throw in one or two. Yeah, absolutely. So then we make it to Thebes. We do indeed. The Big Olive. Yes. Uh, made to feel very much like New York, but it doesn't lose the aesthetic of ancient Greece as they're trying yeah. to present it, but at the same time feels very different. Yeah, it's got little tokens. There's the stoplight. There's the guy trying to sell them a sundial instead of a Rolex. There's the crazy end of the world guy. A lot of sto a lot of New York tropes. Yeah, the shall we chariot say. chaser, pepperoni pants, all this yeah. other stuff. And then you have an old snarky man saying that he's going to retire to Sparta, yep. aka Florida. Yeah. So there were a lot of kind of little little parallels, which I thought were quite funny. Really enjoyed that. It briefly became a Woody Allen film, and I'm fine with that. Oh yeah. So then, whilst Herc and all that have been making their way to Thebes, Meg strikes a deal with Hades to get two years taken off her sentence. Because she gave her soul to Hades to save a man she was with and then he was a dick and fecked off and left her. But anyways, she has to get Herc into a scenario where he can be killed, basically, because Hades needs to get rid of him. So enter Meg and Thebes saying that two little boys have got lost and need help. And one of the, the two little boys are pain and panic. And hilariously enough, they shout out at one stage, somebody call IXII, which I thought was Hilarious. because That was very good. Somebody call 911. And Herc goes in to... Goes in to save the little boys. 
and he's able to lift the giant rock, which, funnily enough, is blocking a rather giant cave. What's in the big cave, Breath? Well, there's a giant dragon snake thing, and he brings with him much vengefulness and much animation style changing. Oh, I have that down here. The animation for the multi-headed creature looks super different to the whole rest of the movie. It's so strange. It's so jarring how different that is compared to everything else. Yeah, again, just to lean back on the difference between, I guess, the main characters and either the song sequences or the backgrounds. There are so many different mixtures of animation and the dragon snakey thing kind of feels a little bit like it's supposed to be part of... A more fluid style. I don't think it's supposed to stand out that much. Yeah, I don't think so either. It almost seems like, as you said earlier, that Hercules went massively over budget. It seemed like there was supposed to be a consistent animation style the entire way through. Yeah. But for budgetary reasons, different things took different... Yeah, because the... This, like, creature is very 3D animated. Yes. It looks very 3D, whereas all the characters and everything else in her... Well, the characters especially are very 2D. They're very flat. Yeah, very flat. So it's very... It's very. It's almost kind of as if they... I don't know if this is the case. It's probably not. But it's almost. it almost looks as if they handed Pixar this character and said, can you draw this for us? And we'll do the characters. It's not the case, but it, that's how it kind of looks. That's how different the styles look. And I have down here, how many heads you got to chop off before you realise it's multiplying, you gobshite? Uh, yes, that was a little bit problematic. But following on from that, we did have the halftime joke. Yes. So, bang, smack in the middle of the movie, Hades says, relax, it's only halftime. And it's exactly halfway through the movie. Which I'm fairly sure was only slightly intentional. Yeah. I think it was supposed to be a rough thing and ended up being pretty damn exact. I'd say it was a throwaway line that James Woods said and then it was adamant with the animation that they were going to make it fit exactly halfway. And of course this leads into a very prominent song indeed. My hands down. Oh, is it my favourite Disney song? One of your favourite Disney I think it's songs. my favourite Disney song because I'm sorry, you can't not enjoy Zero to Hero. Zero to Hero is so it's outrageously a, infectious. It's a bop. It, I have that down as well. Such a bop. Yep. And I have down arguably the best Disney song ever because it is so goddamn catchy. Herc was on a bap. Oh God. He was on a bap. He was on a bap. And it's such a bop. It is such a, it is such a bop and a bap. Bap bop. But it gives, the reason I like this song, there's so many different aspects of it. So you see Scar in it. You see that Herc went and built a massive extension on his mom and dad's house. As one does. human mom and dad's house. Did he get planning permission though? That's my question. Oh, I don't know. We'll have to check it on board. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Then there's also loads of cultural references. You see Marilyn Monroe and the stars. You see Herc and Pegasus doing their imprints on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Obviously not Hollywood there. There's also Air Herc, which is a reference to the Air Jordans craze in the 90s. There's so many cultural references but it doesn't seem dated. It doesn't seem dated. And I think the part of this is another note that I had from the sequence, which is that the color palettes that they use are very, very stark. Oh, yeah. To the point where it doesn't feel like they're just doing a quick montage of the scenes they would have embellished earlier. There are very, very stark color contrasts throughout the entire thing. It feels a lot more like a newsreel footage. Yeah. And that benefits it so much. So after Zero to Hero, there's a scene where... Herc goes back and visits Zeus in the Temple of Dad. Mm -hmm. And Zeus says a fantastic line, which is, being famous isn't the same as being a true hero. And I thought that was such a great line. Oh, it's a fantastic line. And especially in, I suppose, I think it even rings more true now than anything where being insta-famous and being an influencer and all this crap is seen as the be-all and end-all. Whereas... At the end of the day, it doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't mean that you're doing any good for the world necessarily. It's not you being a hero. No, absolutely not. I mean, I mean that speaks to another thing, which is that the biggest heroes you'll ever encounter in life are ones you don't even know are heroes. Yeah. Because they're quietly getting on things, getting along with things in the background. And that's more a test of how, you know, virtuous they are, how noble they are, how ethical they, they may be as people. But the thing is, that doesn't make headlines as a broader comment but ultimately if someone is a celebrity again fame is not the same as being a hero you can be a hero to some people or you can be an idol but it is not the same thing so even now actually no especially now as you highlighted 
that's a really important thing to, to cast the spotlight on. Yeah, absolutely. So then we have Hercules is getting a portrait done onto a onto a rather fetching pot. I uh, love a nice bit of nice bit of crockery. And he's wearing scar. This was a bit jarring. I'll be totally honest. Yeah. I wasn't too on board with this because when he's just doing this, when he's just standing and posing for this particular thing, yeah. you can see that it's scar, and that would have been fine. Yeah, as a bit like yeah, a nice little Easter egg or anything like that. There's the point where he jostles it about in front of the camera, where it just looks like scar without a skeleton. Yeah, that's weird, and it would have benefited from my from my perspective anyway. It would have benefited from that not being there because it's way too distracting. Yeah, it's a bit, it's very a, hey, look, we're definitely doing an Easter egg. They haven't quite got the Pixar subtlety when it comes to Easter eggs. No, brick through a window subtlety is more what this is. Yeah. And then his lovely portrait section gets bombarded with 90s fangirls. Um, yes, it does. And Phil is still being a creep. He's being a creep, but mercifully he's still portrayed as a guy who is completely ineffective in that strategy oh yeah which is very important in all in all seriousness that this is not working for him he ultimately has absolutely no idea what he's doing and this is good it would have been a much worse thing if it was actually working as a strategy so in the throngs of the fangirls coming in also meg manages to sneak her way in she does and she's been tasked to find out what Herc's weak points are. Has he got an Achilles heel, as is mentioned many, many times in this movie? Yep. So she, they plan a whole day where they go and do all these lovely things and then they come back and they go for a walk through the garden. And this is where potentially one, another one of my all-time favourite Disney songs come from, which is Meg's song, I Won't Say I'm In Love. It's very, very nice. It's also in many ways sort of traditional, almost... Disney side character princess when the focus is a man. Yeah. What it also manages to do is it nicely tells you her backstory. Ultimately, what she wants is freedom. She sold it for a man who ultimately rejected her. Yeah. And then out of either, I guess, bitterness or revenge or even sort of self-preservation became a total badass. Yeah. And for the time that fits. Yeah. Absolutely. It fits extremely well and it's more a case of, nope, this can happen to you and you do what you have to do to survive, but that doesn't mean you have to lose who you are. Absolutely. (laughs) So during this time, Meg isn't singing just by herself. She is aided by the five muses, which does lead to one of my favorite Disney facts and one of my favorite Disney crossovers. So as Meg is parading around these very opulent gardens, she walks past the muses whilst they are five clay busts. Yep. And if you look at them, and if you are a Disney Parks fan, you will know that these busts directly mirror the busts from the Haunted Mansion. Not Phantom Manor, because Phantom Manor only has four busts, but the one in Disneyland especially, it mirrors them exactly. The way their heads are tilted and everything, it mirrors the busts in the Haunted Mansion, and it makes my heart so freaking happy. It's a lovely reference overall. In fact, the entire, all of the visuals behind this song are absolutely great. The notes that I have are Thebian Nights, because it looks almost exactly like Jasmine's Garden. Oh, yeah. The way that it's kind of structured, that's the first thing. And the song itself is very Shoop Shoop, which I absolutely love. And again, that leans a lot more into the Motown, more so than the gospel, which is great. Um, It's a tremendously defiant song. So like we're going through here and there's any number of things happening. There's, um, as I have a note, I have a note here, which reads, Charlie Demick spent two days installing that water feature that gets man- that it gets mangled. Yeah. There's a lot going on here. And all it does is paint Megara as someone who, yes, she was introduced to someone who's a bit conniving, but she's a very conflicted character. Yeah. She has so many more layers than most female characters, particularly up to this point would have had in an equivalent film yeah i agree so we then have the return of hades he has well and truly established that megara is hercules's weakness yeah that they are absolutely in love and that she needs to use her to get to him so he goes and he confronts hercules in his training arena arena even And I have down here, first of all, why is Hercules John Cena? This is a fair question. 
They're very similar. They're very similar. And to be honest, if there was a live action version of Hercules, I would probably cast John Cena. Yeah, just Im- impossibly positive and good. And you want to hate him, but can't. Yeah, totally agree. It's the Superman type quality. No, because I really don't like Superman. I know you don't like Superman, but it's the same type of trope. Yeah. In the sense that this is someone who clearly doesn't have a weakness, so let's make his weakness far more human. Yeah. And this is something for what's ultimately a deity of sorts. And yeah. that works so incredibly well. Yeah, absolutely. So Hades gives Hercules the option. He will free Meg if Hercules gives up his powers for 20... 28... I was about to say 28. 24 hours. For 24 hours, which give should, in his mind, give him enough time to release... What are they called? Release the Titans. Which should give him enough time to release the Titans, overthrow Zeus and all the rest of the gods, and enact his terrifically evil plan. His dastardly plan. Yeah. Hercules, however, puts in a stipulation that he will only agree to the 24 hours if nothing ha- nothing were to happen to Meg in that period of time. Yes. Crucially that Meg in no way gets hurt. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that. He takes away Hercules' powers in a very Ursula taking Ariel's voice type dealio. He goes very grey in the animation style. He does. Hades takes off in his chariot, which would it's make a... Trem- fab. He w- it would make a tremendous Mario Kart vehicle. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love that. I pick that every time. Yeah. That orange shy guy be laughing. Perfect. So he releases all the Titans and they only really seem to be able to say kill Zeus and that's it. And they go the wrong way. Oh, bless them. I and love that scene. It's, it's such so a small good. detail, but it just goes, uh, guys. Elsa's looking very different. Yeah. Little, little freezy guy. And the one eyed demon that he sends after Hercules desperately needs a pedicure there's a certain amount of uh, neglect in the whole um everything you know self-care going on there yeah he needs he needs to go get his nails done all of them he does indeed he's let he's letting down people with names derivative of mine down unfortunately o'sullivan comes from o'sullivan meaning essentially son of the cyclops oh yes there you go folks bit of irish for you there you are happy days so the cyclops goes after hercules and he is getting beaten to a pulp because he is trying to save the people of Thebes. He's trying to do what he's been doing the whole time. And Meg, being the badass that she does, steps in and she ends up getting a little bit squished. Yeah, she was quite crushed. Yeah. And I would put that down as major badass points. Yes, I agree. I agree. And as a result, because of the agreement that he made with Hades, would be that Meg would not come to any harm. Unfortunately, she harmed she quite harmed. So he gets all his powers. So in the meantime, we see Zeus and the rest of the gods being overthrown by the Titans. Yep. And we get uh, Hades being charismatic Jafar. Oh, yeah. Is exactly how he comes across yes, to me. Yes, I agree. Because Jafar, I like as a character, but is a bit dull. Yeah, he's a bit dull. But this is charismatic Jafar and I oh, am yeah. on board. Oh yeah, so while the gods are getting dragged down to the underworld, Hades has an amazing throne and is drinking a cocktail, which, why do the parks not offer these as permanent cocktails? It's a purple cocktail with a green gummy rum in it. I would buy so many. Uh, you definitely would, as would I. Would I want gl- that green gummy worm. Would a purple glow cube in it? Oh my god, it would be amazing. Uh, Disney Parks, please get on that. Yes, please. We get the amazing line from Hades, which is, it's a small underworld after all. Which I appreciate it. Love, love a Parks reference. Give them to me in all movies, please. So, Herc arrives. He saves his dad. He does. He unearths him from the mounds of Frozen snow, lava. Lava, ice. Detritus that he's currently buried in. Detritus? Detritus, yes. Oh my lord. Brefney Brefney also has... has an English degree. <laughs> I only get to use it once a week. Enjoy right. it, lad. <laughs> oh dear. So... Herc saves his dad, who in turn is going to save all the rest of the gods. And Herc then hops back onto Pegasus and goes to save Meg. Then we unfortunately have the very untimely death of Meg. We do, which is one of the very few direct character deaths of a non-villain in any Disney movie. Yeah, which is bizarre. 
it's very, very straight. It's very jarring. Yeah. Because you do kind of feel like, oh no, it's going to be fine. She'll hang on. She'll persevere. She's a badass. She can get through everything. But like, no, she's literally been crushed by a Titan. This is a serious thing. Yeah. So Herc makes his way down to the underworld. He ain't taking no for an answer. He's going to go sort this. So he can, he rides in on a three-headed dog. As one does. As one does. And he strikes a deal with Hades that he can, he will take Meg's place. So he is going to go into, is it the River Styx? It's essentially the River Styx, yes. So he's going to go into what's essentially the River Styx and he is going to find Megara in the sea of dead people. And he is going to save her and in turn he is going to take her place. Yes, the catch being that he has to survive the River Styx. Exactly. And the way I have this described is as Hercules is swimming through and trying to get to Megara, he starts to look like that scene in Beetlejuice when Adam and Barb start to shrink after Otho like summons them and they start to like almost get like vacuum packed. For lack of a better way of phrasing it. We watched Beetlejuice today. We literally watched reference. Beetlejuice today. Um, it's a very accurate statement. So the fates are just getting ready to cut his thread of life. When as a result of him dying, he is doing the ultimate act of a god. And he is sacrificing himself for the greater good. So his thread turns gold and he ain't going nowhere. Mm-hmm. And they break their little scissors off and they're very sad. Yep. It's a great scene because you don't see it coming. Yeah. And it's very well done. And Hercules emerges as this triumphant hero out of the River Styx, glowing gold. Fortunately, as I wrote down in my notes, Meg has been backed up in the cloud. Oh my God. Thank you very much. I'm here all week. And this leads to Hercules casting Hades into the River Styx. Yes, which I can only imagine he was probably there for quite a while. He probably was because there was a number of people who were a bit miffed Mm, with him. He didn't see. He didn't seem too thrilled. No. Um. So they were kind of gone. Pain and Panic seemed reasonably happy about this, to be totally honest. And oh, I can't yeah. say I blame them. It doesn't seem like the most virtuous employer in the known universe. No, absolutely not. So Hercules brings Mel's soul. Mel. Hercules bring Meg's soul back to her body, and then they hop on a cloud elevator straight up to meet the godly folks. As one does. As one does. And this leads to the, first of all, acceptance of Hercules, both as a god and also as a human. Oh, yeah. So he gets completely celebrated as someone who has proven his worth as a true hero and therefore worthy of standing in the pantheon of the gods. And that works exceptionally well. However, Hercules, as part of his, I guess, execution of becoming a hero, has not forgotten the importance of being human. And a large part of this can be attributed to both Megara and his adopted parents. Yeah. So he decides that what he actually wants to do is stay on Earth. The glow disappears. He gets rid of his tan. He gets rid of his tan and he goes down and embraces Megara. And that leads into the closing song, which is a total bop. Oh, it's so good. We cannot forget though, Phil gets his moment. Phil absolutely gets his moment because the one thing that Phil always wanted was for someone to just go, that's Phil's boy. And that's exactly what happens. And it comes right after an exceptionally sweet moment with Herc's adoptive adoptive parents. It's so cute. It wraps everything up so nicely. And I loved this movie. Now, I've seen it twice. Yeah. Throughout my entire life. Once a few months ago and once two days ago when we watched it. Yes. I got so much more out of it the second time. And I think it's an exceptionally sweet very well done movie with brilliantly written and constructed characters throughout every throughout every aspect of this film. Yeah. I I mean I I adore Hercules. I can watch it anytime. It was one of those movies that was always upstairs in the cast room. So if ever there was DVDs that were vaguely damaged or people returned or whatever or if a new movie came out, we would have a copy of it upstairs in the cast room to watch on breaks and stuff like that. And me and a guy called Graham who used to do a lot of the deliveries. The two of us loved Hercules, so we would just watch it all the time. It's one of those movies that I will never not be in the mood to watch Hercules. I can, regardless of how recent I've watched it, I can put it on and it'll make me happy. So yeah, it was really nice getting to kind of, I suppose, put a different lens on it because obviously I've passively watched it hundreds of times realistically at this stage. So it was nice kind of getting to proper like, proper focus on it. So... 
we wanted to go through and discuss the four different topics. So what would you, how would you, if we do all the ratings out of what, five? I'd say out of five. Okay. So what would you rate the animation style out of five? This is very tricky because okay. this seems like three movies smushed together. Okay. In terms of how everything is kind of put together. I'm a big fan of, I don't mind having conflicting animation styles as long as it's kind of to prove a point. So so a good example would be if you take the Heffalumps and Woozles bit out of Winnie the Pooh oh, or the Elephants on Parade bit out of Dumbo. I'm fine for having those completely cons- those completely changed elements if, for example, it's a dream sequence or a nightmare sequence because you can completely play with it. Um, case in point, if you've seen the, uh, the trailer for Soul, um, it's definitely messing with that yeah. in the transition between uh, between the two different levels of the afterlife. That makes sense. My issue arises when there's no change in the context and you change the animation style because it does stick out quite a bit. Um, However, I really liked this film. I won't give it a five, but I will give it a four. Okay. All right. I, yeah, I think four is pretty all right. There are kind of a lot of jarring elements to it, but there are also a a lot of beautiful elements to it. Oh, absolutely. The color palette are stunning is so nice the movie is lovely to look at my the only reason i would dock a star would be it could have been even more lovely okay fair now story wise what would you give it the story is very very good obviously it, it derives a hell of a lot out of greek mythology in general it plays around with so many different conventions of that i'm going to give it another four okay i'm going to give the story a 4.5 i think there are a lot of really great elements to it i think the flow of the story is quite nice it kind of has a natural progression to it which is massively helped by the music and the interludes and the kind of storytelling songs within it kind of help move it along but um, i'm gonna give it a 4.5 i think that's entirely fair i i'm docking a little bit of marks for as good and all as they are uh the muses because i'm a pretty firm believer in show don't tell i will say i love the muses but this, I'm very sorry. If y'all could see my face. I'm very, she's very shocked and disappointed in me, which is part for the course for our entire relationship. Oh, but, stuff. but nonetheless, I'm a firm believer in if you can show these elements of the story without specifically having people call it out. Great. I think it's a very nice storytelling mechanism in Hercules to do it this way. But it does kind of feel a little bit, especially with the casting change that it's a little bit of a paper over the cracks, that it feels like there were one or two other things that could have gone in there. Okay, okay. Having said that, absolutely do not dislike in any way, shape, or form. All right. Um, Cast and characters. Five. Yeah, I don't think... I I might go 4.5, just purely because of the Joshua thing. That's not his name, by the way. I'm well aware that's not his name. I think his name is Tate Donovan, but it's... I completely see that, but I think as regards what his job was, which is, can, oh, yeah. can you be an adult Hercules? Yes, he can. It's unfortunate that now we have the weird curly haired guy with negative charisma from Friends as how we know that guy. Yeah. But as a performance, Hercules, ultimately, this is kind of the weird thing you play with. Hercules is Superman. And Superman as a character is really, really, really boring. Oh, yeah. And as a result, there's not a huge amount of a huge amount of movement. It's partially why you need the animation, for lack of a better term, for all of the side and supporting characters. Yeah. As well as the villains. Like I don't think Hercules would work anywhere near as well if it wasn't for how much of a commanding presence Hades is. Yeah. Or Megara. You do need Megara to be the stronger personality. She's not the damsel in distress, but Hercules is a little bit too c- cookie cutter. Yeah, and I I think that's kind of the thing. Like he's obviously the main character. And I think it's, I suppose, maybe Hercules as a character, I would maybe give a 4.5. But I think that's because that traditional cookie cutter, good guy type dealio is just not my particular taste. It's not my cup of tea. But However, it... all of the other characters, which normally would be kind of secondary supporting roles, completely take over. The muses are fantastic characters. Hades, Pain, Panic, Pegasus, Phil, Meg. There are so many excellent characters agreed that it's a, I, I feel like i won't give it a 4.5 i'll give it a five you'll give it a five i'll give okay. it a five I'm but glad I, you I, came I won't to a reasonable way of thinking yeah i, I won't i won't talk too much for joshua because i think that's just my own correlation with it it's, it's in fairness it's a fair qualm to have yeah 
And last but not least, I know what I'm giving this. I'm giving the music a five. I would give it more than a five if I could. I'm giving it a four. <gasps> and I'll tell you why. Brefty. I'm very sorry. It's been a nice four years. It, I mean, it's like, bye everybody. Uh, this has been uh, Brefney on the one and only appearance on Make My Movies. Um, yeah, I'm giving it a four. Actually, you know what? I'll be nice. I'll stretch it to a 4.5. What are you ducking marks for? I'm ducking marks for Phil's song. Because as a song, it's it's all over the place. I think that overall, if we take the entire score in terms of what it's designed to do and the style of it, yeah. and the performance of it, yeah. if we take Phil's song out, is an undisputed five. My issue with Phil's song and why it docks it by half a star is because it doesn't feel like it fits. It feels a little bit like a rejected version of a song from Rocky mixed with Friend Like Me. It feels like it's designed to serve a story purpose and they originally didn't mean for it to be a song, but it is actually a song. And Danny DeVito is not that limited in terms of what he can do. Oh, I don't agree. I really wanted a better song in that place. Not full-blown hoorah genie type territory, Yeah. but I did feel it could be better. Having said that, Zero to Hero is a great song, the opening song is great, the closing song is great, but the entire soundtrack is not perfect for me. And for that reason, I'm giving it a 4.5. But if I could give it a 4.7, if I give it a 4.75 out of 5, I probably would. Well, I'm giving it a 5. That's fine. Overall, out of 5, what are you giving the whole, mo- whole movie? I'm giving it a really solid 4. But only one of your things was a 4. Everything else was above a 4. That's right. Okay. I'm giving it a really, really solid 4. Okay. Possibly extending to a 4.5. I really, really liked this film. To be honest, I reckon I probably would have given it a solid 4.5 if I'd liked it, if I'd seen it as a kid and yeah. liked it as much as knowing me now, which is essentially the same thing, just with a professional occupation. I wouldn't, I would, would have given this a much higher subjective rating. So if you give me a subjective rating versus a technical rating, so what I think versus how I think everything is technically how much i liked it 4.5 technically about a four okay i'm never talking technically okay this is is all purely based off pure subjectiveness oh yeah this is a 4.5 yeah okay i'm obviously giving it a five it is one of my all-time favorite movies let alone one of my all-time favorite disney movies i absolutely adore it in every way shape and form so i was never not gonna give it a five i think that's entirely fair and i expected absolutely nothing different yeah so the last thing I wanted to do, so I posted on the Instagram that we were going to be discussing Hercules and for people to send us in their thoughts on it. So I just wanted to quickly read some of those out. So we have the lovely Samantha from the girl.in.the.castle. Hi, and, Samantha. And she said, wonderful and an underrated soundtrack. And I wholeheartedly agree. I do agree the soundtrack is underrated. So good. Um, then we had Ash Keenan, Ash.Keenan1. Hi, Ash. And they said one of the most underrated Disney movies, which I also agree. I think in recent years, it's definitely becoming more prevalent. It absolutely is. And I think part of the reason is because it was never exactly prioritized as a Disney Vault release. No. It was always kind of just shoved out there from time to time. It was off the market for years. Yeah, it was. Whereas now with Disney Life previously and Disney Plus going forward, I think Hercules is going to have a much more prominent position in people's minds. Yeah, I agree. They're also slowly but surely bringing out more Hercules merchandise. So in the past year or so, Shop Disney have had significantly more Hercules merchandise than they have ever had before. Could they bring out that action figure with the popping pecs and the arms to do that? That would be great. That would be class. I would love one of those. There was also that whole Funko Pop range of which I have 90% of. You have most of that and in fairness it's a cracking range. I think the only things I didn't get were standard Hercules. I have Hercules on Adult Pegasus. Which is one of the best pop vinyls I've ever seen. It's very good. I have him. I have the two different versions of Hades. Yep. I have Megara, I have Pain and Panic, and I have Baby Pegasus. Baby Pegasus is adorable. So freaking cute. So yeah, I have I have most of them. But yeah, I definitely think it is completely underrated. Um, Sandy, who is Glotini underscore Genie, which is a great name. That's great. Hi, Sandy. She said, Phil is that one Irish uncle everyone has, and Hades, dot, 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 I can relate. Love that movie. And I wholeheartedly agree. 
Agree completely. He is very much that uncle who might end up in prison for a bit of tax dodging. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have one of those, you know. Yeah, I've got one of those, technically. Yeah. <laughs> then we have somebody that I'm not quite sure that just said Robin Hood should have won. I don't know who sent that message in. I think it was a bitter L. Betty. A or bit, a bitter L. Brefney. A bit, no, no, no. Well, well, if someone has the name Brefney, they might be a bit bitter for various different reasons. But I am mm. not standing by anything like that. Robin Hood is at some point going to be discussed... And I will discuss why technically I would probably rate it lower than Hercules, but nonetheless. Still. Then we have Kira underscore McCarthy underscore saying, my favorite film. The music is amazing. And I love Meg. Kira, we are kindred spirits in that. Thank you for sending your message in, Kira. Then we have Mad with Dizzy and they've said best villain ever. And you know what? I think I agree. I think Hades is one of the best Disney villains ever. I wouldn't put him as the best one, but I would certainly put him among the best. Who do you think is? I think that's an entirely separate episode. Okay, interesting. We can do that. Then we have Laura's Palette of Thoughts, and she said top notch with a little thumbs up. You're right, Laura. And then we have, last but not least, Wendy, which is destination underscore dot Neverland. Honestly, a highly rated movie, yet still feel it's under it's underappreciated plot, characters, and music. And I, again, completely agree, Wendy. Wendy, I absolutely agree with you. So, yeah, that was Hercules. It was. Overall, I think it's a very interesting thing that we came from such different perspectives on this movie. Yeah. Because I was just coming in as, for lack of a better term, film studies wanker, who Mm -hmm. is coming from things at a different perspective and used to, and is very used to just drilling animation down to its core, down to its core elements without actually having any sort of talent to create my own typical critic. Eh, But nonetheless... I found this a terrifically charming movie. Oh, it's and so good. I, it's one of very few movies that I've seen as an adult that I've gone back and just gone, man, I wish I'd seen that as a kid. Yeah. Because I would have adored it. Yeah. I would have absolutely adored it. Yeah. As, as I've said many times, Hercules is a firm favorite with me. It has been since I was a kid. So it was nice, I suppose, kind of having a different, a different spin on it, shall we say. Indeed. And uh, overall, I think that was a cracking first episode of this little hey, side project. Good job. Well done. That was a terrible thum- thumbs up. No, that was a terrible high five. Right, we'll give that another go. Hey. Hey. So keep an eye out on the Make You Waffles Instagram. We will post in the next few days two more options and we will let you guys pick. Again, we won't tell you whose is whose, so you'll just have to guess and yeah let us know what you think do you have any other thoughts about hercules that you would like to tell us please do get in contact let us know um is there anything else that you'd like for us to cover in these episodes Are yeah there... please let us know this yeah. is the first episode of a new venture as part of mickey waffles as a whole so any suggestions you might have or any particular perspective you want us to look at things by all means let us know because we'll take a look at it and consider everything yeah, we'll also get Kate to pick an episode uh, movie for us at some stage as oh, well. Oh, 100%. Give her full reign. She's going to pick something. She's going to make us watch Cars. She's going to make us watch it. We're not going to open that door. She's going to make us watch Cars. She's going to make us watch Cars. But we'll cross that bridge when we'll we get to it. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But yeah. Yeah, thanks for listening. Stay safe, guys. And wash your damn hands. Wash your damn hands, folks. And thank you for listening. Bye. Bye.